Yes, so <clears throat> I probably will, uh, shouldn't overstay my welcome by coming here too often <laughs> and entertaining you, but uh, I'm delighted that <coughs> Peter Lacks won the Arbor Prize this year. Uh, Peter is a person who has influenced my mathematics and personal life uh, over many years. Uh, he was a, I was a student at Stanford where his name ran big and was always spoken about in the hallways to a large extent because of a collaborator of his, Ralph Phillips, who I knew uh, when I was a student and who I later collaborated with myself. In fact, if there's one thing that uh, Lax and I have in common is we realized how great a collaborator Phillips was and a remarkable gold mine for getting work done and brilliant work done, and uh, I will mention some of their joint work. Now, it is true that uh, the selector, which was supposed to be ready six months ago, got moving very quickly when the Arbel Prize was announced. I think they were moving very slowly, but as soon as the good news came, they somehow got this together. But of course, in doing it very quickly, I can imagine the set of mistakes as rather large density. For example, I've already found a mistake on a page which has not even got a number so early on. <laughs> and that is that the editors are apparently my dad, myself, but that is in fact not true. Lax was very much involved in editing this. And in fact, the fact that he was involved is something that makes the selector much better because he has commented on men with a very personal touch on many of the papers. Uh, I wonder if I could read you what my dad and I wrote and uh, let me admit also Kathleen Moravitz helping us <laughs> uh, about, about the preface about this, because I think it describes our feeling about Lax and about the selector, which we think will play a big role. Peter Lax's research spans many areas of pure and applied mathematics. It ranges from functional analysis, partial differential equations, and numerical methods to conservation laws, integrable systems, and scattering theory. Many of the papers in these volumes have become classics. They are must read for any serious student of these topics and the impact continues to be felt both explicitly and implicitly in current research. In terms of insight, depth and breadth, Lax has few equals. The reader of the selector will quickly appreciate his brilliance as well as, master, as his masterful touch. Having this collection of papers in one place allows one to follow the evolution of his ideas and mathematical interests and to appreciate how many of these papers initiated topics that have developed into a life of their own. It proves that even in today's highly specialized world of mathematics and science, it is still possible to work across disciplines at the very highest level. And uh, I think that describes my feeling uh, about Peter Lax, and that is the versatility and depth. It's, it's quite easy to be broad and shallow, but uh, Lax uh, has broadened it. Now, I've chosen as my topic to discuss the part, some parts that are certainly in the selector of his work and show its impact on developments which are uh, closest to my own interest, not exactly my own interest, but are the closest anyway, and that's the geometry of hyperbolic equations. And it's this mixture of geometry and spectral theory that I want to describe. All right, so the paper I want to start off with, it's also listening this morning to the beautiful lectures, uh, it occurred to me that 1956 and 1957 were clearly a time in Lax's career when ideas were flowing to his head in a rush, because he obviously did many of his marvelous works. Where's the chalk? <laughs> uh, he did many of these marvelous works uh, during that period, not that he didn't stop after that, but this paper that I want to describe first is a 1957 Duke Journal Math, Duke Math Journal paper. Its title is Asymptotic. Can you see at the back? I'll try to write a little bigger. Asymptotic solutions of oscillatory initial value problems. And I'll This is about linear hyperbolic equations, but the geometry is nonlinear. The motion, the, the motion along the characteristics, which I'll describe in a second, that's not linear. 
And in fact, all the problems I'll talk about have to do with linear hyperbolic equations and its connection to geometry. So he sets up the following problem. He has an equation mu, linear hyperbolic system. u is a function of t and x. He sets it up in many variables. So u is maybe u1 down to un, a vector. x is in rm, t is in r. And m, that works. Yeah. <laughs> Slow, yeah. Uh, I guess I'll try to speed this up in a moment. Stop. Yeah. M is the following operator. Uh, M of u is u sub t partial to u dt. That's the time variable plus the sum j equals 1 to m of some matrices aj applied to u sub xj partial respect to fj plus b u. A and b are smooth functions of x and t. All right, they're n by n matrix functions. <coughs> and I want this, we're going to study initial value problem. So at time zero, I want uh, to have a well-posed problem and that, and also be hyperbolic. So we're going to assume that P1A1 plus P2A2 plus PM, I, use, I will use his notation. Later people change it somewhat. This should be for, for PJ and R in variables. For real values of P, he actually discusses this a little more generally, but let's assume that the eigenvalues of this are all real. So that this matrix for any choice of P has n real eigenvalues, which I'll denote by lambda of those variables. Maybe I'll use this in order not to slow down too much. And <coughs> this problem he studies is this highly oscillatory. And the reason I'm introducing this is this paper I view as the genesis of Fourier interval operators and the theory of propagation of singularities. And it really is, and I'll show you what he does. So he looks for solutions of the form. Today we would put a e to the i x c. I guess L would today stand for lax, but it, to, most people would put your phi. But this is the first paper, so L was used. A function x of t into some function v naught plus v1 over c plus v2 over c squared, which at first we study purely formally, but the main point in this paper, as I will explain, is that this is mathematics and he's going to prove something rigorous, which turns out to be extremely useful. So you want to find solutions in this form. This is obviously called the phase. And if you plug this into those equations and try to solve recursively for powers of xi, xi has a real number. Xi is going to infinity. This is highly oscillatory. That's what this is all about. Then if lambda, so that's lambda. Remember, lambda is a function of t um, x, p1 down to pm. So if lambda is our eigenvalue, then you will find that in order to match, if you like, in powers of C on applying M to that and equating like powers, you'll have to have that uh, a certain matrix here has an eigenvalue and the V will have to be an eigenvector of that eigenvalue equation and the key equation will be dl dt, this is a first order nonlinear equation, equals lambda t x1, x2 down to xm. L sub x1 down to L sub x m. A first order nonlinear equation for L. This is nonlinear, it's appearing inside the eigenvalue, which he ap appropriately calls the icon iconal equation. Because it's the analog of the iconal equation in geometric optics. <coughs> it's exactly what it is. And then he solves this for small t. So this is going to be an important point for t small. He solves this by the same method that was described in the previous lecture, by the method of characteristics. And the characteristics for this equation are, of course, the bi-characteristics for the linear partial differential equation. So he solves this for small time with one of the branches. There are n branches. In the end, he needs to produce enough solutions in order to Fourier synthesize the entire story. 
And then on solving this and then putting V naught as an eigenvector, you get an equation for the Vs and you repeat it recursively, get similar equations. The e equations for the Vs are the famous transport equations. So in this way, you formally construct a solution which is accurate to arbitrary order in C. And the geometry of the picture has already come out here with the characteristics of this Eichner equation. He carries on in this paper to uh, Fourier analyze an arbitrary initial solution, and, and the point I want to point out is that he constructs a parametrics to such a symmetric linear first order hyperbolic system to arbitrary order for small time. And that's uh, such a construction in some other special cases was known by Adamant and Marcel Ries. But this was the first general construction, and it was picked up by Holmunda in a paper I'm going to show you now, uh, and then developed by Holmunda and Deustemat in the theory of Fourier integral operators. So, like many things, like was in the previous lecture, Lax put forth the ideas. Sometimes he leaves them, sometimes he carries on with them, that were crucial in uh, the developments later. And as I say, this is the genesis for that theory. So out of this, he constructs a parametric, so I'll call it the lattice parametric, or fundamental solution to this equation up to arbitrary smoothness. Parametrics for the equation, the original equation, up to arbitrary smoothness. All right, now I want to emphasize the role played by the geometry. I need a bigger piece of chalk. <coughs> and the setting I will make here in order to apply this is the one that actually was taken by Holmunda, where he just developed this idea in the following setting. So let X be a compact. Riemannian manifold. A problem well studied by many people, even at, especially at Courant Institute, by Courant, for example, was what can we say about the eigenvalues of the Laplacian on this manifold? So the Laplacian is just divergence of gradient on functions. One could look at forms, of course. And I want to study this equation. And I'm going to explain the use of Lax's parametrics in this context. It's still the best we know. So I'm going to study this equation. Since this is compact, it's well known that the eigenvalues are discrete. The lambda naught is zero. The constant function is less than or equal to lambda one. Well, it's actually strictly less than lambda two and so on. And you might ask about the behavior of the eigenvalues and the eigenfunctions. This is the standard problem in spectral geometry. At this point, I have to interpolate the standard joke of Lax. Uh, if I'm going to study this, well, one way is you might treat this as an elliptic problem and try to study it that way, very difficult. Or you might try to take one parameter, families of solutions of this associated with various equations, like the Schrodinger equation, the heat equation, or the wave equation. Since we're talking hyperbolic, it's clear which way we're going. And it turns out the wave equation is the most powerful, and I never forget this line of Lax. It's much better to sh shed light on the matter rather than heat or uncertainty. <laughs> All geometers will immediately look at the heat equation, because it's, from the point of view of PDE, by far the easiest, and it smooths everything out and it dissolves all information. That's not a bad thing if, or if you want to dissolve the information away. So, for example, if you're interested in the topology of the manifold only, then actually the heat equation is not a bad idea, and as probably was mentioned in a year ago, there is a proof of the index theorem using uh, the spectral theory in this, using the heat equation. That's when Padotti first developed that. And for topological reasons, it's quite natural to not worry about propagation of singularities or the fine structure of the geometry of the manifold, like the motion along the bi characteristics which I'll describe in a second. Uh, I think even more impressively recently is the work of Perelman, which you really want to throw, again, all the information away and be left only with the topology. So there is this remarkable 
theorem of per Perelman, which uh, as far as I understand, I don't know why the community is a little shy about actually coming with a definite statement, but all experts are apparently quite convinced that he has a proof of the Poincaré conjecture. And the proof uses a heat equation, a nonlinear heat equation of Hamilton's Ricci flow. And in geometry, if the topology of them, if you want to just make uh, things round or just worried about crude stuff, then uh, heat flow seems actually optimal right now in our present understanding. But if you want to understand the eigenvalues, Lax is absolutely right. The wave equation is much more inform informative, and that's what uh, Homanda did. And let me explain how. It's quite a simple idea here. The relation between that parametrics there that Lax constructs and questions about the eigenvalues. So suppose I want to solve the wave equation. I think I'm motivated enough now, so let me write it down. It's this equation on x cross r. So the time variable is that. It's a second order equation, which of course could be written as a first order equation in the lax form over there. <coughs> now, one connection between these, because the time variable is obviously playing a quite different role to the space variable, I could separate variables just like you do. This is one reason you diagonalize that operator in this fashion. And so you could, the fundamental solution I'll denote by KTXY. Formally, this fundamental solution, let's say at time zero, uh, the function is supposed to have uh, some initial value, and the derivative at time zero should be zero. It's a second order equation, so I dictate two conditions in this linear equation. So the solution will be e to the i, oh, sorry. Uh, let me denote the eigenvalues as, as most people except me denote them by k squared energy squared. That's a more natural parameter, sorry. So then the fundamental solution, if I make it even the way I did, is cosine kj, it's called it's capital K, kjt phijx phijy. Now that's a formal sum, but it's a distribution in T. The important thing about a hyperbolic equation when I was discussing this construction with large C, if you analyze what that means, it's analyzing singularities and it's really already got all the information about propagation of singularities. So this is a distribution in T, it's singular, but its singularities can be determined for T small. So if you use the lax parametrics over there for T less than or equal to T naught, one can actually determine this function up to a smooth piece arbitrary smooth that you wish, that's his fundamental solution. And so you know it explicitly on the one hand for small t, as long as the time is small enough so that this uh, Eichnell equation hasn't developed any caustics. I'll return to that in a moment. And then if you want to solve this equation, uh, on the other hand, this is a formal solution which as a distribution makes sense. So for small t, I'm pointing out that we know the solution up to smooth pieces. This whole subject about large C that Lax introduces is only about up to smoothness. And if I then integrate kt xy, or xx, let's put x equal to y. I mean, the idea here is quite simple. Here's my manifold, and I start at time zero. I put a delta function at y. That's what the fundamental solution is. And I'm looking at how the waves propagate out. The singularities propagate out after time t. They will propagate along geodesics because the geodesic motion will be exactly the bicharacteristic motion for this wave equation. And so after time t, but if t is small, there's no boundary to this manifold, nothing really will have happened other than local stuff. And that local stuff is what Lax is telling us how the uh, prop, uh, singularities propagate. So we will know this function against, say, any smooth function, C of t against even e to the 2 pi i, let's say k t, where k is arbitrary large, as long as this c of t has small support. I know this function. So let's suppose the support of c is contained in minus t, uh, whatever my parameter was there, t naught. t naught plus t naught. On the other hand, if I do this integral term by term in this putting x equal to y, I'll find that the same expression is equal to the sum of c hat, I'll get clearly a Fourier transform coming through here, of k minus kj of phi jx 
is smooth and compact support near T naught. C hat is going to be a Schwartz function. It's going to be rapidly decreasing. It's not compact support, but let's pretend it is. You can't have a function in its Fourier transform of compact support. And in this way, what I'm getting is what I uh, have always called the lax range, because it comes from the lax parametrics, is you'll understand the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions in a range in this kj parameter, some kj between k and k plus 1 of phi j x squared, and you'll know exactly what this looks like, because I'm saying the singular part of this I understand when k goes, gets large. Sorry, this is a 1. So this is Hormanda's idea that if you now, you'll know this uniformly in X. X rise, lies in a compact manifold. I should have said that the phi j's are on orthonormal basis, of course. So if I integrate that with respect to X, I'll be counting the number of eigenvalues. I have here, of course, that weight function, which is, I'm just treating as 1 and 0. That's cheating. It's really k minus k j. But ignore that. Then I'll be counting the number of eigenvalues between k and k plus 1, and I'll know exactly at least an upper bound for that. So you'll find that the number of eigenvalues, so this is the key to understanding this problem. This less than or equal to 1 is less than or equal to k to the n minus 1 is what you get from the other side. And from this, Homander is able to obtain uh, a sharp bound for the number of eigenvalues less than x. And the best we know, it's actually sharp on an n sphere. And this is all a consequence of the analysis of a wave equation and the small parametrics. Well, Homander wanted to go further, as I said, and he naturally wanted to extend this analysis of the singularity of the fundamental solution there, or to extend this analysis of lax here for all t, and that theory becomes quite complicated, because at that point you have to allow, for large time, things, caustics to develop, and the theory of Fourier integral operators, especially his second paper and the paper with Deustemart, are quite involved, but they're part of the modern machinery of hyperbolic, linear hyperbolic PDE, and it allows you to study this for all t. Unfortunately, it doesn't give you any new information on this kind of problem. If you want to look at these eigenfunctions more closely, which is something I spend a lot of time trying to do for many reasons, if you try shorten this, well, it is true you'll understand the singularities for large t, but there are contributions that come from periodic orbits that are often extremely difficult to get to the bottom of. In any event, this 57 paper I view as the genesis of Fourier integral operators, and let me move on. So between 61 and I would say 95, more or less, I think Phillips was already in not such good shape by 95, uh, Lax and Phillips had an amazing collaboration. Uh, I think I've said on another occasion, reminds one of the Hardy-Littlewood collaboration. The only thing is I never say who was Hardy and who was Littlewood in this analogy. Uh, they produced a number of books and they produced many fine works, and I want to go through one aspect of their works, and that is a work which naturally evolves from these set of ideas, except that we now move not to a compact manifold or a local problem like this, but a global problem in Rn. And let me point out again that they were the initiators of what today seems obvious to us, that we all study the geometry of the manifold in connection with this kind of problem of its spectrum or, or scattering poles. But at the time that they started, not, these were all fresh problems. There was certainly scattering theory in physics, but I will explain in a moment that they really did these, they really introduced geometry into this problem. So here's the setup. We have n-dimensional space, Rn. I guess this we call acoustic scattering. You have a domain in Rn, let's call it omega. And the, the domain's not the important thing. The scattering, this is going to be an infinite space. I'm going to look at Rn remove omega, the complement. And we're going to study the wave motion outside there. So we're going to study the wave equation, UTT equals the plus in U. So it's a hyperbolic equation. Certainly those techniques are going to be relevant. We have U on the boundary is zero. Uh, omega is compact, or the closure of omega is compact. 
or we have some other self-adjoint boundary conditions, such that the normal derivative of u on the boundary is zero. One of those two. And we want to study the solutions with some initial conditions for large time. Scattering theory is about, they're going to be solutions. They actually axiomatize this uh, setup into incoming and outgoing waves. But you all, I think, know what you're supposed to imagine in scattering theory. You send in a wave from some, some plane wave, for example, and then you go back at infinity and look at how these waves look when they've scattered back. And the question, of course, is how does the geometry or the shape of omega impact the scattering theory? <clears throat> now, you could just try apply the spectral theorem. I mean, you can always solve this equation if you know the spectrum of, say, we have initial conditions in L2. So we could look at L2 of Rn minus omega is our space. And then make Laplacian with a self-adjoint extension with some something of that nature, and then separate variables like there and reduce it to questions about the spectrum of the Laplacian. In fact, that's what physicists do. They discover that in this kind of situation, unlike in the compact manifold case, compact manifold case, everything's dictated by the eigenvalues that we were talking about over there. But in this case, the thing that dictates everything is that there's no, L, there's no compactness of, of the Laplacian, so the spectrum could be continuous. In fact, it's a theorem of relic that it is continuous. And then the finer structure comes from understanding the analytic continuation of something like this. You take this to the minus 1, the resolvent, and you meromorphically continue it. And it has poles. And those are the poles of the scattering problem. That's how most people would attack it. But Lax and Phillips uh, take a somewhat different tack. In fact, they were highly impacted by a beautiful theorem of Kathleen Morovitz, which was concerning how do the solutions of this equation, this arbitrary initial condition, behave when t goes to infinity. So think of having this wave equation here. Think of making some disturbance here and letting it flow. Well, it would seem that the energy would go to zero locally. The way this would clearly be necessary to understand scattering theory. And Morovitz was able to prove, before Lax and Phillips started this, that uh, if this domain was star-shaped, then, in fact, not only does the energy decay, but it decays exponentially locally. This was uh, a crucial uh, theorem, which I think started Lax and Phillips in the early 60s in this direction. Uh, this led them to study the following, and they first worked with Morovitz, actually, to try and interpret that exponential decay in terms of the scattering poles. Now, one thing that Lax does well, you saw that this morning in his lecture, is he likes to abstract, but not to abstract nonsense. <laughs> so there's always uh, a feature of being somewhere in between. You abstract enough so that everything becomes clear, but you don't start talking about, say, a random Banach space. So the Lax-Phillips scattering theory does exactly that. It's set up to handle a problem of this nature. If I take the complement of omega, they have set up a theory of certain spaces. They call them incoming and outgoing. I don't want to get into that technicality here. But it's a bit like an abstract spectral theorem. They eventually obtain a certain representation of the solutions called a translation representation. And with that machinery, they can have an abstract theory which tells you what the scattering poles are. And most importantly, and this has turned out to be extremely important even in modern automorphic forms theory, and I'll end off by explaining these kind of connections uh, as far as certain analysis that's absolutely needed of this time, is they, from this abstract theory, they are able to identify a semi-group and a generator of a semigroup. So actually, I learned something this morning. I thought that the semigroup part of their joint work was always Phillips, who had written these big, fat books with Hiller called semigroups that, that are sort of, uh, that I think uh, Ralph Phillips himself rejected the subject eventually, saying it's just abstract. But you saw the argument with the fragment Lindelof this morning, a uh, semigroup was used before you met Phillips, <laughs> I guess it was in your blood too. Uh, Phillips, of course, uh, 
somehow was brought up on semi-groups. And one of the big insights that Lax and Phillips have in their so-called time-dependent scattering theory is an introduction of a semi-group ZT, I'll just call it by notation, it's a semi-group, and it's infinitesimal generator B. And this infinitesimal generator B has compact resolvent. So you've got to see something comp compact somewhere, and you saw Lax going through great trouble this morning, and great joy, actually, in showing you something was compact, because he was analyzing the eigenvalues. He didn't know what they would be, but he had to show you that where they accumulated was only at zero. That's some kind of compactness. And there's a similar feature here, that a, the central theorem, which starts, as I said, in part with the work, combined work with Moravitz, is the statement that there is an operator B. I'll just give it a name here. It's going to play the role of the Laplacian in a compact space. And this operator has eigenvalues. It's got a compact resolvent. It's got eigenvalues in the complex plane. It is not self-adjoint. And its eigenvalues times i, actually, are the scattering poles. So these scattering poles, which are very hard to understand by just saying meromorphically continue this thing here on a generic vector, which is the standard approach, comes out extremely naturally with this operator B, which has got a very nice definition. And with that, you can ask all the questions about the relation of the geometry of the complement of omega Rayleigh to the eigenvalues of B or the scattering poles. And they started to analyze this in uh, a series of papers, which eventually led to the, the famous book of theirs on scattering theory. Uh, what is going on here? So much for working this thing. It's just very slow. <laughs> so slow that it stops. Yeah, you know what? I'll just use the one. <laughs> That's a good idea. Thanks. You can, uh, you can erase and, and lower. Maybe, uh, actually, I remember the same difficulty two years ago. <laughs> Obviously, last year, there were no blackboard talks. Maybe I'm taking you in the wrong direction. All right, the main conjecture that emerged from their work is the following conjecture. And it essentially has been solved, but the subject is still very much, very active after a certain person whose name I'll mention in a second. And that is, they introduce, let me introduce a very important notion which they found, and it's always the notion that's the important thing. So omega is non-trapping, just to show you the beautiful connection between the geometry of the classical motion and the solutions of the hyperbolic equation. Omega is non-trapping if um, there's a ball B containing omega. Maybe I draw a picture. Here's omega. It's a big ball B contained in omega, such that if you take any vector point and direction inside B, but outside of omega, okay, it's, if there's a B contained in omega, an L finite, and a finite number, such that if you take a point in direction and you undergo linear motion, I am setting up the wave equation so that the geodesic motion is just straight line motion. Otherwise, it would be the obvious change if you were in other spaces. And you obey, of course, this will just go out to infinity. It's no problem. But if you hit the obstacle, you obey angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. And what I want to know, it's non-trapping, is that after time L, I'm outside of B. I cannot be inside B, no matter where I start, for more than time L. L finite such that any V in B remove omega will be out, you know, the flow from there will be outside of B after time L or less, but after time L, I'm outside. So that would be a non-trapping situation. So a convex body is clearly non-trapping, and all the previous theorems concerning the convex body or the star-shaped body, those kind of things were handled before. The conjecture was Z of T, the semi-group, which I'll tell you what its connection to the poles in a second, but the main conjecture they come at, came up with is Z of T is eventually compact, for t large enough, so this is not b, this is z, which implies in particular, which implies, it's a little more than, implies that 
the poles, the imaginary part, parts of the poles of the scattering, of any definition of the scattering operator, of the scattering operator. go to infinity. So it's a very strong statement about the location of the poles <coughs> and about exponential decay of local energy. So this is eventually compact if and only if omega is non-trapping. So this is a very clean and basic conjecture. So they have found the geometric condition on the billiard motion outside the domain which ensures this fundamental fact about the solutions and about the location of the poles. And this was proved in one direction, the easier direction, that is uh, if there is a trapped ray, the direction, I don't know if that's this way or that way, but in the direction where there's a trapped ray, this was proved by Rolston early on, and in the opposite direction, first by Ludwig and Morowitz, as I was saying, for Start, uh, for convex domains, but the general case required the full force of that whole machinery developed by Hormander for the purpose of analysis, complete analysis of propagation of singularities, using that machine and a number of quite extra ideas. This was resolved by Melrose. Sorry? Taylor. Okay, sorry. And Taylor. Thank you. <laughs> I should be at so this conjecture turned out to be correct, turned out to be the basic, but of course in this kind of subject you could then say, well, where are the poles? How many poles are there in a ball? Just like we have these theorems about Weyl's law. And naturally these questions were raised and they are still studied with great uh, effort by primarily Melrose's students, people like Zworski. One has a quite nice picture, but the main conjecture that was seen early on by, by Lax and Phillips was that and, and was resolved uh, uh, a good 15 years ago. It is impressive to me because today there's a lot of, there are a lot of physicists who are very interested in su the subject which I am too called quantum chaos which is a question about really the eigenfunctions and their behavior on a compact manifold when the classical mechanics is complicated. So, of course, when we have a non-trapped ray, that is not complicated. This ray comes in and it goes out. But suppose I had something like this. Even this is quite hard. Nice work of Ikawa where you have two bodies like that and you have a bouncing ball, unstable bouncing ball. Just one unstable bouncing ball like that, Ikawa was able to prove that the scattering poles accumulate on the real axis. Quite a nice result. But if you put three balls, Well, nobody really knows what's going on anymore because there are going to be very complicated uh, periodic orbits there, unstable periodic orbits concentrating on sets of small Hausdorff dimension. How do they impact the poles? These are quite difficult questions. So if you're going to ask such a, a difficult question about the location of the poles or the nature of the poles uh, as uh, determined by the geometry of the ball uh, of the classical motion, then why not already go to something a little simpler that at least doesn't have infinity and have poles, but let's just look at a compact manifold for which a geodesic motion is highly chaotic. And that's a very popular subject by physicists, primarily, funnily enough, just like rational dynamics. Rational dynamics is a study of iterations of a polynomial on the unit, on the, on S2. It was studied by Julia and Fatou brilliantly but they never saw any pictures of what they were talking about. In the 70s, things changed dramatically because you could actually draw pictures of this and then all this phenomena came to the fore. And indeed, then a lot of mathematicians uh, moved in there trying to explain it. It's still very difficult to explain. It's, it's, it's easy to generate pictures. To analytically prove these things was very difficult. Uh, Sullivan was able to do quite a lot and many others, but the entire picture is not understood. This is very similar. If you have a classically chaotic system and you actually want to compute the energy levels, there are numerical methods now to compute many energy levels in a classically chaotic system. And one has amazing theories. Michael Berry is one of the champions of these theories, some remarkable conjectures. Every one of them is false, but they're probably true generically. That's probably true. Uh, 
you know, of course, when I have a discussion with him, I say it's false. He says, yes, because you made it false. <laughs> That's no, uh, you know, a uh, physicist has a different idea about the world. He says, jiggle it a bit, it'll be true. I said, I agree. <laughs> so these things are probably true. It's conjectures, but we don't have the tools to tackle them. The main difficulty in all those problems keeps on, I keep on coming back to this construction of a parametrics of lax, which only works in that range for small time. What you buy by going to all time by this fancier theory, you lose by the fact that all of a sudden in these chaotic systems there are an exponential number of periodic orbits, for example, and prevent you from looking at one eigenfunction at a time. So anytime you want to look at one eigenfunction at a time analytically, it appears to be a very difficult problem. There's only one way around that, and that's number theory, and that's another talk. Not for this uh, occasion, really. I do want to point out, however, that Lax and Phillips then continued on this kind of scattering theory on uh, suggestions of uh, Fadiev and Pavlov, that their approach, which I didn't describe, but I just described two things out of it, a semi-group ZT and a generator B, that that approach, this time-dependent approach to scattering theory, might work very well on other manifolds. And Lax and Phillips pursued this quite seriously. They wrote a book on this. It's called Scattering Theory of Automorphic Forms. And what it amounts to is this. Instead of looking at Rn remover domain, let's look at something that's a little different from some point of view and a little simpler from another point of view. So they have mainly worked in hyperbolic end space. Let me remind you what that is. So Hn is going to be hyperbolic end space. So what does this mean? It's non-Euclidean geometry in N space. So the line elements are the, I'll have Y, X1 down to Xn. Maybe I'll make it Hn plus 1. So the usual upper plane would be Y, X1. I have Y and N variables. And the line element for this geometry is uh, dx squared plus dy squared over y squared. That's my simply connected universal space. Hyperbolic end space, it's constant sectional curvature minus one. And I won't bother with raising and lowering anymore, except the indices. It's a bad joke, okay. <laughs> oh, it's All right, this harmonic analysis or the study of the eigenfunctions on such a space itself on the whole hyperbolic space. So we have this metric. It's a homogeneous constant curvature space. It by itself is a little too boring even for, any, for them in the sense that the whole space, it's like looking at Rn with no, no obstacle. So what we're going to do here is instead of taking Hn plus 1 and remove an obstacle, which we could well do, and they have studied that too, we could introduce topology into the picture and that they do, by taking a subgroup gamma, a discrete subgroup, of motions, of the motions, of the rigid motions of this geometry. Well, it turns out to be, in this case, it would be a subgroup of an orthogonal group of type n plus 1, 1, because that's the isometries of hyperbolic n space. I could show you, uh, I mean, they generated by <clears throat> the transformations, of course, if I take x and I just translate x and keep y fixed, that'll be our isometry of that metric. If I take that point y, x, and I multiply it by scale lambda, each coordinate by lambda, that's also an isometry. And you can show those basically generate all the isometries. But of course, the isometry group is a Lie group. And let's take, it's a Lie group, and let's take a discrete subgroup which may or may not be infinite or finite volume quotient, and let's take Hn plus 1 divided by gamma. So what are we really talking about here? We're talking about something which started with hyperbolic n space, maybe the hyperbolic plane or the hyperbolic disk. And we quotient out, we might get something like this, where that's identified with that, and this is glued in some way like this. I might get a compact quotient, well, knowing Lax and Phillips at that point in their life, they want to talk about scattering theory. If you compact, there ain't much scatter to scatter about. But if you finite volume, so a picture like this, <coughs> where the volume is finite but not compact, for example, if there's a cusp, 
This is already very interesting to them, and there is a continuous part of the spectrum, and there's a beautiful scattering theory that they can develop and that for the setting. And getting once you are accepting that, in a sense, you should also allow infinite volume, and they certainly do. So you might have a picture like this. This is glued to that, so in fact, the manifold has an infinite horn and may have some topology at the bottom. Or the finite volume case, it's got a cusp. And scattering theory is about coming with a wave from infinity and seeing how it comes out, and it's uh, measuring this geometry in the bottom of it. Fadiev had point, and Pavlov had pointed out that their method applies rather well here. And so naturally they developed their theory here, their time-dependent theory, and they were able to prove uh, analog theorems to what they had before. And there are two big things that came out of their work. One of them, so let me state these, one is that B, the analog of B, is extremely important. Turned out to be, for me anyway, and Ralph Phillips, extremely important. So the analog of B is going to be an operator whose eigenvalues are at the poles of this scattering for this problem, which turns out had been studied in this finite volume case to great importance by one of the great Norwegian mathematicians of our time, Atle Selberg. Selberg had studied the continuous spectrum of finite volume quotients like this in our path plane. It was then pursued further by Langlands in very important work to quotients of arbitrary locally compact symmetric space with which are finite volume. And that theory is really at the heart of the modern theory. And what I want to point out to you is that there are two things that Lax and Phillips did, besides reproduce some of these results, but there are two absolutely crucial ingredients that they have given to the subject, which even experts are not aware of. So I want to, this would be the place to point it out, given that this has had a major impact on the subject. The one is the analog of B. So it turns out that if you want to study, say, this problem here, where you have a finite volume quotient and you deform it, and you are just studying the Eisenstein series themselves, it's extremely difficult to follow what happens when you deform the manifold. It turns out that the quotients of two-dimensional hyperbolic space with finite volume actually form a moduli space, and you can deform this eigenvalue problem. There are finitely many parameters, often called Teichmuller parameters, and you could try to study how the poles of the scattering problem move when you deform. And if you do that, and you try to do it directly in the Selberg and Langlands setup, it's extremely difficult. No one has been able to do it. The operator B is an operator which is not self-adjoint. I, I emphasize it. It's all made for this. It's an operator whose eigenvalues on the plane, as long as you have an operator with discrete eigenvalues, even if it's not self-adjoint, to follow its motion under deformation is, is much easier. And in fact, Phillips and I did this, and were able to understand various important problems of certain nature. This operator played a big role in, in our so-called proof of what's called the fermi golden rule in the setting. The operator B is important there. The second aspect of their work, and this is really not well publicized, so let me do it right here, is that their proof, so they, they give a new proof. I'm talking here only about the finite volume quotient case. In the infinite volume, they are the pioneers of that subject. It's a very active subject. There was some work done by Samuel Patterson before them, but they pioneered and did the whole spectral theory for infinite volume. Uh, I'm a number theorist, as was said before. The infinite volume is of much less interest to me than the finite volume, simply because the actual eigenfunctions that live on these spaces are, are what are called automorphic forms. And if you have, if you, when, once you're looking at infinite volume, you just have too many automorphic forms to have them, expect them to have any fundamental significance in terms of their eigenvalues or their coefficients or their L functions. But in the finite volume, that's, that's the heart of the subject, and that's where they give a new proof. So this is very important. They gave a new proof of the analytic continuation of Eisenstein series, which, which uses the operator B and some cutoff Laplacian in another incarnation. This proof they only did in our path plane, 
and also hyperbolic end space, but it's not there that it's so important. Their proof has been picked up by Colin de Verdier and Mueller, let me mention these names explicitly, and I want to point this out. So their proof is important because of it. When you generalize it, and this is done by Colin de Verdier, who gave a variant on this, proof of the analytic continuation of Eisenstein series. And then recently, Werner Mueller uses this method of analytic continuation rather than the one of Selberg and Langlands. And it has a fundamental advantage. Selberg and Langlands, Langlands, especially in higher rank, was able to give the meromorphic continuation of all Eisenstein series that he needed. But his proof was very, very indirect and soft. It used things like fragment Lindelof, but uh, it used several complex variables and reflections on boundaries. There were no estimates that came out of this proof at all. And estimates are sometimes needed. <laughs> Not always, but sometimes are everything. So, for example, when you were finally all done with this theory and you understood the Eisenstein series, you had no clue about how many poles there might be in a region. Never mind the right number of poles, like I was talking about a moment ago, that Zworski is trying to count the right number of poles in a scattering problem. But in these higher rank symmetric spaces, the proof of Langlands gave the Eisenstein series a meromorphic, but no control of the order of the function. So you get meromorphic functions, and you don't even know they are of finite order which at first was not too much of a bother. However, in recent years, after the work of Kim and Shahidi especially, there are really major breakthroughs in functoriality, the functoriality conjectures of Langlands, which emerge by developing Eisenstein series on E8 and E7 exceptional groups. And in those, at the final step, to finally prove something is modular, you need to know that, a certain, that your functions that you have, which are in fact entire, are finite order, or you can't make your modular form by this construction. And the only proof that we know of finite order appeals to the bounds on the number of poles that come through this method, this different method of proof of analytic continuation. So what I gave you there was a five-minute spiel about the following. I'm often asked, well, what is it that Lax and Phillips did that Selberg didn't know? You know, people like to put questions simply like that, and the answer is, well, they knew, they meromorphically, well, Selberg would say an infinite volume, I'm not really interested, <laughs> if any of you know his accent. Uh, but in finite volume, he is absolutely interested, and his proof does not easily give, and it's never been able to give so far, that doesn't mean someone might not do it, but so far, the uh, estimates do not come that method, and Mueller has obtained those estimates. Mueller also proved the trace class conjecture by the same set of ideas. So this proof turned out to be really important. All right, I think I have a few minutes. I won't go into any of the many modern things that are happening except to say one thing which might amuse Peter. Um, in their book on automorphic forms, there's an interesting chapter called How Not to Prove the Riemann Hypothesis. <laughs> not how to prove it, how not to prove it. Well, obviously, they looked at a particular hyperbolic manifold and its scattering properties. That hyperbolic manifold is the following one that is the first one you come across. You look at the hyperbolic plane, the upper half plane, and you divide it by the following specific gamma, SL2Z. So you're all familiar with this, because this picture appears everywhere on many conference posters. This is the upper half plane. If you take a two by two integer matrix, you can bring any point z into this region here. This is minus one, one. This is minus a half. That's plus a half. And when you form the quotient, you'll get one cusp, and you'll have a corner here. Corners don't bother us at all. And the manifold looks something like this. It's not compact. There's a scattering problem associated with it. And you can ask about the decay of energy in that part of the spectrum, which purely has to do with scattering. So you imagine taking a wave in the cusp, throwing it into this particular arithmetic manifold, as I would call it. Watch what comes up back. And it turns out that one can compute the scattering operator for this, as they point out in this section, as, of course, was known to many people in a different language. 
And that scattering operator is the Riemann zeta function. And the question of the energy decay that was so successfully handled when you're the exterior of a convex set where there's nothing tricky going on, if it only were true, yeah, you would get the Riemann hypothesis. But of course they point out that this is problematic. It's a very small part of the spectrum and I guess that eventually became the title of that section, how not to prove the Riemann hypothesis. Well, let me say you rush too quickly here. I'm not about to announce a hypothesis, but I am going to tell you something that's kind of interesting, in my view. Suppose you're a little more modest. How to prove the prime number theorem? Okay. So the Riemann hypothesis is a statement that all the zeros of the Riemann zeta function are on the line of half, and you can get a million dollars there too. Probably if you did that, you'd get two million dollars. You'd get this million dollars and that million dollars, neither of which would be easily earned <laughs> by proving the Riemann hypothesis. It would be a hard way to earn it. Um, if uh, you, so the prime number theorem is a statement that the zeros of the Riemann zeta function do not vanish, the Riemann zeta function does not vanish on the line one. And one can ask whether this spectral interpretation through scattering or resonance is the same statement, can be used to prove non-vanishing on the line one. And the answer is not only can it be proved, done that way, but Lapid and Gelbart and I recently wrote a paper showing that the generalization of that method to most general symmetric space gives all known cases of non-vanishing of L functions on the line one, including many cases which cannot be handled by Adamar and de Lavalle Poussin's methods. There's a standard method which actually I can show does not apply and cannot apply in our present technology to those cases, and yet the spectral interpretation through scattering is enough to achieve that. Well, you can look that paper up at Contran do note a few months ago. Thank you.